Hello everyone, in this week we are going to study chapter 2 of your textbook, Some Tools of the Economist. So first we talk about an important cost, which is an opportunity cost. What is an opportunity cost? It's the highest valued alternative that must be given up as a result of making a choice. So opportunity costs are incurred when a choice is made. So any decision making actually has an opportunity cost. It can be monetary and non-monetary. It can be both or it can be only monetary or non-monetary. And they are very subjective and very across person. If an option becomes more costly, an individual will be less likely to choose it. Let's see one, one example from your life. So consider the cost of going to the college. The first thing comes to your mind are the monetary costs, tuition, books, and fees. So these are opportunity costs because you can use that money to buy a car, for instance, or buy a house. Therefore, it's a foregone opportunity, monetary costs or opportunity costs. How about non-monetary costs? So first of all, when you go to college, you may not choose a full-time job because it might be too much to work as a full-time job and also uh, go to college. And therefore, the foregone earnings for a full-time job is another opportunity cost. It's non-monetary because you're not paying for it or you're not getting money, but foregone earnings is also an opportunity cost. So given this example, opportunity cost is the sum of, let's write it here, this is important, I want you to understand this. It's the sum of monetary plus non monetary cost. That is opportunity cost. Why it's subjective? Because of non-monetary section, right? Because what you could earn as a full-time wage earner, we don't know. So this, we have it, this because as you remember the first week we say that time is scarce, right? When time is scarce, you should choose to do one thing and if you use your time going to the college, then you may not use your time at the same time to get a full-time job, okay? So next we talk about trade. Trade creates value. Mutual gain is the foundation of trade. Value can be created by exchanges that move goods to individuals who value them more. So one example, okay, to understand the trade. Tom Brady, everybody knows Tom right can mow the lawn in two hours okay but he also at the same time in two hours he can act in a commercial and he could make 100k okay forest gump let's say the neighbor for tom brady can mow the lawn in four hours so as you see he is mowing the lawn in longer period right two hours compared to four hours but his second best alternative is work and mcdonald's part-time earn 15 dollars per hour right so now, what is best for Tom? Should he use this two hours in mowing the lawn and forget about 100K, or should he pay, let's say Forrest Gump $70 and Forrest Gump mows the lawn and then um, that's for him also the best outcome because compared to second best outcome, she could, he could earn $60, $60 in four hours. So as you see, trade creates mutual gain. Tom Brady gets 100K, Forrest Gump gets $70 for four hours. This is how trade works. And you might say Tom is better doing both, right? Act in a commercial plus mow the lawn in a short period of time, but still it's better for him to trade. So when we talk about trade, we need to talk about transaction costs time, effort, and other resources needed to search out, negotiate, and consummate and exchange. Transaction costs reduce our ability to produce gains from potential trade. So you want to get a meal in the middle of the night, but then you're thinking about, should I get my clothes on? Should I drive the car? These are all transaction costs, but internet reduces the transaction costs and enhance trade. For instance, you want to buy something, now just you can go in front of the computer and search for what you want and then order it. Middleman, a person who buys and sells or arranges trades. Middleman, reduce transaction costs. This is why people value their service. For example, local grocery store is actually your middleman. Why? Because instead of going buying vegetables from the farm, you're buying it directly from the local grocery store. So there are some questions here that you need to think about. 
do it on your own, answer them. And now we will talk about the importance of property rights. What is a property right? Property right means that you have right to own a property. So that means you have right to use, control and obtain benefits from a resource, good or services. So when you have private property rights, you have right to exclusive use, you have legal protection against invaders, you have right to transfer that property to someone else. So one key point, keys to prosperity, clearly defined and enforced private property rights are a key to economic progress. Why? Because private property rights creates a powerful incentive that generates private ownership. Okay, so for instance, just think about would you be open to have a business in Syria when there was a war over there? No, because you don't know that you would be able to actually keep the property even if you could make money out of it. If there is a stealing, damaging opportunity or if the government can take the property from you without any question, then you're not going to invest and you're not going to start your business. So there are four points to private property. Private owners have a strong incentive to use their resources to provide others with goods and services valued highly relative to cost. So let's say you own an empty lot next to the university. So you see that there are not enough restaurants around it. What you can do is you can develop, um, construct a building and then uh, start rent this building to the restaurant owners. So you're going to add value to the people or the students in the campus. Private owners have a strong incentive to care for and manage what they own. If you own a property, definitely you are going to have a strong incentive to care for. You are going to keep it nice because you may think that you're going to sell maybe in the future. Private owners have an incentive to conserve for the future, especially if the property's value is expected to rise. Private ownership makes owners accountable. With private property rights, owners are liable if their property is used in a manner that damages the property of others. So, when private property rights are protected and enforced, permission of the owner is required for the use of a resource. Okay? So, that means if you want to use a good or resource, you must either buy or lease it from the owner. Individuals and firms confront the opportunity cost of their use of scarce resources. Therefore, private property and markets are linked. Market prices provide a strong incentive for private owners to consider the desires of others and to use and develop resources that are highly valued by others. You can see on this slide a couple of uh, questions that you might think about it. And one of these questions is your discussion this week. Organs for market, it's totally um, not legal on any country on earth. So, but you have to think about pros and cons of this um, markets for organ argument, okay? And next we will talk about production possibilities curve. So you see on the screen Susan's production possibility curve and assume that she has only 10 hours of study. So that means her resources limited, right? He, she has only 10 hours to study either economics or English or both. So therefore, he, she needs to find the best way to allocate resources. Okay. And production possibility curve shows that if she uses all these 10 hours studying these two objects, how much grade she could get from each subject. So if you look at the first point here, this one shows that she spends most of hours to study economics. So she gets A from economics and English she gets D. If she spends equally for both classes, then she gets B from both subject. And if she's here, she's going to get D from economics, A from English. Okay. So mapping out all the ways Susan can divide her time and all of them equals to 10 hours. Okay. Spending 10 hours to study 10 hours. And production possibility curve shows us that uh, maps out all the ways Susan can divide her time, which is limited resources, between these activities. And that's why it's called production possibility curve. So consider an economy produces two goods, clothes and food here. And again, the economy has limited resources, right? Even if you use all the resources, you have limited resources. So that means you can choose to produce any amount of cloth and food using 
all your resources. So if you use all your resources, that means that's called efficient, efficient production, then you are going to be on any point on the production possibility curve. So point S, use all your resources for production of clothes and no food. Point A, most of the resources for clothing, some of the resources for food, equally distributing, and most of the resources used for food, and all of them use for food is T. So anything inside the production possibility curve is inefficient. That means you can do better. You can, by using your resources, you can move to point B. At point B, you have maybe the same amount of clothing, but you have more food. You see, anything inside the production possibility is inefficient. That means you don't use all your resources. Okay? And any points on the production possibility curve is efficient. That means you are using all your resources. And anything outside of the production possibility curve, like here, F, is unattainable. Why? Because the given the resources you have, you cannot produce point F. So how is there a possibility that we can increase the production possibility curve? Yes, we can. An increase in the economy's resource base will expand our ability to produce goods and services. One of them is technology. Why technology? Because technology improves the speed of production, especially cost-saving technology. Just think about manual farming, okay, and versus machines, right? When the tractors, machines are introduced to the farming, you can produce much more output in an hour compared to manual farming. An improvement in the rules is the second one. So laws, institutions, and policies of the economy can increase output. For example, if the institution set such that private property is enforced, then you will see an increase in output. One example is 18th century patents were introduced and then suddenly we see a jump in the production possibilities curve production increases because people want to get patent and reap the benefits of having a patent. By working harder is the third one, but this has a cost because if you work hard, you need to give up your leisure. So leisure is important for human being too, but if everybody gives up labor, production possibility curves increases and moves outward. Another one is the investment. Investment also increases production possibility curve, but it increases the production possibility curve for a future period. Let's think about point A. Investment is such, this much, and consumption goods is more. If you invest such, then you might have a production possibility curve in 10 years, here, a new production possibility curve. But when you increase the investment, let's say you are investing more compared to A, you will see that the production possibility curve outward shifts outward much more compared to investment in the initial case of IA. So what happens with investment when you save more today, you put it in the bank, and then banks give that money as loans to the small businesses or any businesses that wants to expand the factories or expand the business. So these loans are creating new jobs and new job means more income and that increases the production possibility curve. So the more you save, that means the less you consume, the more you save, the more investment you have, the more future increase in production possibility curve. And the next one, we will talk about trade output and living standards. First of all, we have gains from trade because of division of labor and specialization. So what does that mean? So you go to college because you want to be an accountant, right? What you want, you want to earn wage and then trade this salary with others to buy what you need. So that means you're not going to grow your own vegetable. That means you're not going to fix your clothes. You're not going to write your book. You specialize being accountant and then with the salary you earn, you trade with others, okay? So specialized workers become more skilled with time. Specialization permits individuals to take advantage of their existing skills. Specialization leads to gains through comparative advantage. So the next question is what is comparative advantage? The proposition that the joint output of trading partners will be greatest when each good is produced by the low opportunity cost of producer. So let's understand with Tom example, Tom and Forrest Gump, right? Tom, if he chooses to mow the lawn in two hours, his opportunity cost is 100K, losing 100K. But for Forrest Gump, it's only 60K. 
So since Forrest Gump has a lower opportunity cost, Forrest Gump should specialize in mowing the lawn and Tom should continue to act in the commercial. So as you see, comparative advantage says that this good should be produced with the producer who has the lowest opportunity cost. Mowing the lawn is for Forrest Gump because the opportunity cost is working in McDonald's $60, I'm sorry, not K. And Tom should actually act in a commercial because his opportunity cost is high. Okay, That's the idea of comparative advantage. So with comparative advantage, we actually might have benefit from mass production. So let's say Forrest Gump uh, make the business bigger and then um, mow the lawn of neighbors as well. And if that happens, maybe he invests in a better uh, machines to mow the lawn in a short period of time. So mass production lowers the cost. Innovation, technological change is about figuring about how to get more from existing resources. Technological changes that result in new and improved products or lower production costs are a major source of larger outputs and higher living standards. So keys to prosperity, gains from trade, Trade improves living standards by moving goods from people who value them less to people who value them more. Okay? Trade also makes it possible for people to produce more as the result of specialization and division of labor, large-scale production process, and the dissemination of the improved products and lower-cost production methods. Gains from trade underline modern living standards. Trade makes it possible for us to consume a bundle of goods and services far beyond what we would be able to produce for ourselves. And human ingenuity is important for prosperity. Just to explain, I'm not going to read the slide, but just think about Bill Gates, okay? Bill Gates introduced a new operating system. You might think that he became very rich, but he, do, he didn't only increase his wealth, he increased the wealth of other people. Let's say Susan, is using new operation system, new computer, and doing the job in a very short period of time. So she also increased her well-being and wealth. Okay, so as you see, technology innovations are in fact not only helping the innovator, but also other people as well. So the next question is, is the size of economic pie fixed or variable? It is variable, right? Because we understand that production possibility curves might shift outward with technology investment and also we talk about the right institutions. So economic pie is variable and not fixed. And finally, we talk about uh, economic organizations. We have three basic questions that we need to answer. What goods will be produced? How will goods be produced? For whom will goods be produced? Based on the answers, we have two main systems, two main economic system. The first one is market organization and market organization there are buyers and sellers and they make decision to buy or sell decentralized and um, price mechanism is helping to answer what to produce so for instance if Toyota hybrid car is in demand then Toyota hybrid car markets getting bigger so this is what to produce for whom to produce people who value the most for the existing product who value the most means who wants to pay the price for the Toyota car and finally, how to produce cost minimization, right? Because of competition and try to find the best price to sell that leads to um, efficient production with minimum cost. And that market organization sometimes called capitalism too. And the second major economic thought is political planning. Political organization is the major alternative to the use of markets. Political organization involves the use of collective decision-making government to decide what, how, and for whom goods and services will be produced. So an economic system in which the government owns the income-producing assets and directly determines what goods they produce is called socialism. Okay. And you have questions here for you. And that's the end of chapter two. Thank you for listening.